Welcome to the Ward 5 NAB board meeting, and we'll have call to order in the roll call, please. Yes, Mr. Chair. Um, Gary Cecil? Here. Bryce Chisholm? Here. Jeff Harvey? Here. Council Liaison, Councilwoman Taylor, just entered. Staff Liaison, Abigail Miorga. Mr. Chair, you have a quorum of the Ward 5 Neighborhood Advisory Board meeting. Okay, we'll start with A2, public comment. Yes, Mr. Chair, our first item today is public comment. Members of the public may hear, observe, and provide public comment virtually by registering through the following link, which can be found on the reno.gov forward slash meetings website. Give me one second. The link is as follows, https semicolon forward slash forward slash l-i-n-k-s period r-e-n-o period g-o-v forward slash four a capital o capital j capital g u capital k it should be noted for those in attendance that comments are to be addressed to the board as a whole comments heard under this item will be limited to three minutes per person and may pertain to matters both on and off the agenda the board may not take action upon any matter not agendized on today's agenda. When you are called on for public comment, please state your name for the record and begin speaking. The timer will begin when you say your name and you will be afforded three minutes. If you are an attendee in Zoom and would like to give public comment, please raise your hand at this time. Mr. Chair, our first public commenter today is Mr. TJ. Excuse me. Thank you. Uh, I'm speaking on agenda item C. My name is TJ Harvey. My wife and I, along with our three children, live on the western boundary, boundary of the proposed development. When I initially looked at the plans left hanging on my door, my first thought was, why would they be trying to squish so many houses into such a small area? Clearly, the only answer can be profit. The proposed development does nothing to benefit the community around it. Instead, it will burden its neighbors with increased traffic dangerous ingress egress conditions for those on 7th Street and Rhode Island Drive, a loss of property values and by adding more children to an already overburdened neighborhood and school system. Not only that, Greater Life Christian Center, the church that will be bulldozed, is a great neighbor and pillar of the community. The city of Reno's master plan states its values, uh, it values responsible and well-managed growth. This is not that. The next question I ask myself is what is a cluster development? I found the Reno Municipal Code and read that a cluster development is defined as a development encouraged to support the protection of sensitive natural resources, view sheds, or other unique site features, promote fire safety within the wildland interface, provide opportunities for shared common open space, protect documented wildlife corridors, and provide a more gradual transition to the unincorporated county and public lands. My question is, what does a definition, what does this definition have to do with that small plot of land locked in the middle of an established neighborhood? The definition of a cluster development not only has nothing to do with this proposed development, but quite opposite. It takes some of the last open space and beautiful downtown city views in the neighborhood and will make them obsolete. This is actually the opposite of what a cluster development aims to accomplish. Proposing this as a cluster development alone should disqualify this entire project. The one and only reason to call this a cluster development is to skirt the zoning requirements of SF8 housing in an attempt to reduce the lot size requirements. After finding the Reno Municipal Code on cluster developments, I continued to read and found more and more code violations within the proposed development. To list a few, RMC 1804-903 states one goal is to provide more open space. There's no open space designated for greater community use in this plan. And some of the open space that is, inclu that is included in the subdivision is partially designated as two retention ponds. 6A2 states the development will have no adverse impacts on adjacent properties. They're building two-story homes against the western property border. Two, two per current property. That will drop property values by a minimum of $30,000 for a loss of city views of loan. Was that my three, three no, minutes? No, 30 seconds. Oh. Then on top of that, you will increase traffic, increase um, parking in surrounding neighborhoods and take away already limited community resources, such as uh, adding students to the current Title I school, Grace Warner, where these students will be zoned. Section 6B1 states that cluster developments may be eligible for exceptions to minimum lot standards. Section 6B2 mod uh, states modifications to lot sizes may only increase the density. Can I finish this? Yes, go ahead. The density of the development by 15%. 
SF8 zoning states interior lots must be no less than 6,000 square foot. This development is proposing the average lot to be only 3,500 square foot. That's an increased density of 42%, far exceeding the 15% limit defined in a cluster development. Thank you, TJ. Thank you. Up next is Ashley Harvey. We all received your statement as well, and so I read it this afternoon, just to let you know. Okay. Am I ready? Yes, go ahead and state your name for the record. Ashley Harvey. Uh, I'd like to thank you in advance for your time and consideration. As I am aware of the personal bias I carry, I'll begin by addressing those. When 2605 Everett came up for sale, I was captivated by the view and immediately called my husband. While it was clear the rough shape that the house was in, it had our hearts instantly. We did our due diligence asking the neighborhood and the church about the view, if there were any plans to build, and we were met with resounding no's. We were told that at one point the church had tried to expand and the city of Reno shut it down because it could not safely get a fire truck in and out, as well as other traffic concerns. Uh, all of this stands in my opinion and potentially even more due to how much busier 7th Street is now. Uh, we had to overcome so many obstacles to secure this house, in addition, in, including having to borrow money privately to complete closing. We're a middle-class family that did not have the budget to buy a home and pay for renovations, so we have lovingly spent the last seven years turning this house into a home. We have done everything around the view, including building a deck and just everything about it. Uh, cluster developments are not meant to inhibit home values as far as my understanding goes, and all of the neighbors will take a huge equity hit just by the development. That being said, I do understand business and that I do not own the property behind. Even still, I always dream that the church would have the opportunity to expand, maybe have a, a community center, a garden, a park, something that would actually benefit the community. Before we lived in Reno, we lived in Sparks, and when we moved to Reno, we were shocked at the lack of parks. There are essentially no parks in Northwest Reno, and all of the schools actually uh, close outside of school hours. So that leaves play space for the homes only. Uh, in addition, I have concerns not only as a homeowner, but a citizen. Before the purchase of Everett Drive, we actually lived on West 7th Street. The house where we lived had a very similar uh, bend as the proposed development. Uh, and our neighbors told us after moving in just how dangerous the area was and that two houses down, our neighbors had someone die in their front yard. We renovated 3390 West 7th Street and sold. And uh, within the few years following the sale, our previous house was hit four times. Um, parking is another issue that I have concerns about. Uh, the development states that there will be street parking available, and if that is in reference to 7th Street, that's not logical or safe. Uh, I have a few images attached, but I will have them in the document that will be passed on. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Up next, we have Eva Harvey. Can I? Sorry. <laughs> You're okay. I go? Yeah, state your name for the record and we'll push play. My name is Eva Harvey. Um, I have lived in this neighborhood almost my whole life. And I can't tell you anything about legalities or anything, but I can tell you what it was like to grow up on that street. I remember coming home from elementary school one day and being told that my, best, my sister's best friend's house had been hit by a car. I was, ne I was never allowed to play in the front yard unsupervised after that. The next year I came home and her house had been hit again and I was never allowed to play in the front yard again. Um, aside from never being able to play in the front yard, as I stated, um, I'm also currently a babysitter. I babysit tons and tons of kids in the neighborhood. And in the summer, it gets so hot and these little kids are so rambunctious. And so they come up to me and they run up and they say, Eva, can we go to the park? And I'm 14, I don't have a driver's license and there's no parks within walking distance here. So the best thing I have to offer is to walk down the street to my house to play in the grass in my backyard. And that's not as fun as a park, I don't, I wouldn't say. Um, yeah, that's all I have. <laughs> well done, thank you. Thank you, Eva, that's great. Up next, we have Carter, Coulter Conaway. Potter. 
over. My name is Cotter Conway. I'm actually really here for Sharon Elledge, who's being considered for community, um, community champions. But since I'm also running for office, I'll take this opportunity to uh, give my spiel as I do, as I've been here before. I am running for Reno Justice of the Peace, uh, Department 1. I am very experienced. I have 32 years of courtroom experience as a lawyer, eight years on the bench uh, uh, as a what's known as a pro tem judge, a substitute judge, uh, three years as the uh, court referee. It was a position that actually has been around since 1984, never used until they appointed me to it. And the Reno Justice of the Peace appointed me to that. So I'm on the bench now about three to four times a week. I'll be there tomorrow, Thursday and Friday, for example. Um, so I would uh, love to have your support. I think we need to continue having uh, people who are experienced taking the bench, especially since, by my own knowledge, about three or four of the current justices are retiring in the next two to three years. Um, and I think it's important to have an experienced judge who's already working there, knows what he's doing, uh, has the experience uh, to lead this court into the next 15 years. So um, on November, I would appreciate your support. Thank you very much. Thank you. Up next, we have Tim Smith. Uh, Tim Smith speaking on item C1. Uh, so like the Harveys had mentioned, I recently moved into a home that backs up to this new development. And I would like to say that I'm not anti-development or expansion. It's a uh, part of my bread and butter, I guess. I work in construction, so they employ me and I'm all about expanding and growing. But in looking at these plans uh, for development, the first thing I noticed was that it just did not match the aesthetic of this existing neighborhood. If you drive up and down 7th Street, you'll find that they're all single family homes on decent sized lots, not huge, but not small. And they're all older homes. Uh, a lot of them are split level. You got some two story. And then we're gonna end up having this new development that's all just super close and tight together. And I know most people, if they drive around Reno, you'll see some of these developments in other areas and they, they work in certain areas, right? Um, like TJ was saying, if there's a view that can be obstructed or that benefits it or the city frontage, it works for that type of setup, that's great. This to me just seems like it's about the bottom line and we're gonna cram as many things into this area as we can in order to maxify, maximize our return on investment. You can't put any apartments in there because of the zoning and going through the rezoning process would be difficult. So why not try to use this uh, cluster development in order to maximize our return on investment? But I think it's gonna be a detriment to the neighborhood and just sticking out like a sore thumb. Uh, I, again, I would just reiterate, I'm not opposed to development. And if I would accept it more, if it was single family homes that match the lot sizes that they're abutting up to, um, that would be more acceptable than this. So that's all I have. Thank you guys. Thank you. All right, that concludes our opening in-person public comment. Members on Zoom, if you would like to give public comment, I ask that you use the raise hand feature button at the bottom of your screen. And I'll give you a second to do so if you wish. Seeing none, Mr. Chair. Okay, we'll move on to uh, item A3. I have a motion to approve the agenda for August 13th. I so move. Vice Chairman, I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. And how about a, a motion to approve the minutes for January 9th, May 14th, and June 11th? Mr. Chairman, might I just make a comment about the June 11th uh, yes. uh, meeting? I don't know if the reporter is here tonight, but just want to compliment her on an excellent job. We had a lot of people making public comment, and she did an incredible job of getting each of theirs down to one line, which is really helps in minutes. It's a great record of what was said. So I don't know if you're there, but thank you for the work. Kudos. And I will. Uh, I would like to make a motion to approve the minutes for January 9th, May 14th, and June 11th, 2024. All in favor? Aye. 
I'll second, a second. It. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion is approved. Okay, we'll move on to A5, Council Liaison Report. So prepared. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, Councilwoman Taylor, for the record. First of all, um, I would like to let you know that Carol Crane has resigned from the NAB, as you all know. So while we have this captive audience, I would like to encourage everybody here to please apply for the Ward 5 NAB. You can do that online at reno.gov. And um, the second thing I wanted to let you guys, I have a couple updates. Um, we had the Arlington Avenue Bridge um, ribbon cutting today with the Secretary of Transportation was here and then we had our uh, delegates from uh, the Senate and um, that is really exciting. We will not see any construction until spring of 2025. They have to wait until they can get into the river. So you, you'll you still be able to use the bridge in Arlington Avenue for um, a couple more months. Tomorrow's agenda, we have um, a couple of things. We have the Redevelopment Authority status report and agency um, policies coming up for us to review. We also have uh, the first ordinance of the railroad tracks um, trespassing. We have our bill draft requests coming also, and just I will be advocating for affordable housing, working towards that in that space and supporting those efforts. That'll be my number one concern. And I think that is all I have for this meeting. Any questions? Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you. We'll move on now to a item A6, the staff liaison report. No, not this time, Mr. Chair. Business items, the Reno Police Department. Captain Larson, can you turn on the mic, please? Thank you. There we go. Green. Green means go. Green means Thank go. Thank you. Captain Rob Larson, for the record. Um, I haven't done this in quite a while, so I've kind of been on a NAB tour. First thing I want to go over is the NAB stats. Um, Ward 5, typically... In the summer months, we see a little uptick because kids are out, uh, more opportunity for crimes. But in your area, things are going the other direction. Well, that's a good sign, right? Um, except for aggravated assault. I went and looked for the crime analyst today. I couldn't locate her, so I don't have the reason why those went up significantly over the um, this one month period. Um, so I will find that answer out and get back to you on, on what the cause of that might have been. The other thing I wanted to point out was the June 2023 we are still in the process of converting from UCR, that's the way we used to do crime stats, to NIBRS. Much different system. Uh, NIBRS is much more in-depth. They break crimes out a lot differently. So when you're looking at that 24 number to the 23 number, it's still apples to oranges. Um, so don't be alarmed when you see the high percentages. The comparisons just aren't there. Um, next year. Just for clarification, for those in the audience, UCR is? Uniform Crime uniform Reporting crime System. Crime reporting. Yes. Um, and so NIBRS is National Incident-Based Reporting System. The FBI came out with a new system, um, just more specific so we can get more dialed in on, on crime numbers. So next year, we'll have a much better idea of what the true numbers are. But as you can see, from month to month, uh, we're trending in the right direction. Uh, the second piece that you asked me to come tonight for is kind of give a deeds overview. Before I get to that, I do want to mention uh, this Thursday is the opening of the Public Safety Center. Um, so you're all invited, 1 o'clock. Uh, it's going to be beautiful. I don't think we're doing tours because they're still doing some odds and ends inside. So it's still a construction zone. Uh, but it's a beautiful building. I was actually in there today. Um, in my 26 years here, it's always been, yeah, a new building next year, 18 months, 18 months. So over the past 26 years, this was a long 18 months. Um, but we're here. We're here. Uh, we actually have people moving in um, next week. Um, so officers are actually going to start working out there next week. So it's a really exciting time for us. Uh, Captain Larson, uh, could I just ask a couple of questions about the chart? Absolutely. The other one. Um, just to clarify, you're saying that the 22 um, aggravated assaults, we should not take 
there's something wrong with that number? No, that one I got to figure out because the May and the June were good. It's comparing the June 24 to June 23. Those two numbers are apples to oranges. May and May 24 and June 24, those are good numbers. Like I said, I looked for the crime analyst to figure out what that jump was, and I couldn't locate her today. Okay. And for simple assault from, from 20 this time last year to 41, is that in the same bucket or is that a bona fide change? No, same same bucket. That's that's a change. Um, May to June is, is a good change. Um, again, tried to locate her today and just wasn't able to do that. And these tallies are for incidents or actual arrests? Those are for incidents. Incidents, so they don't all result in arrests. Um, that's what Nibers, that's exactly one of the points Nibers is looking at is to dive deeper into those. Typically, um, we have an incident later on down the road. We have an arrest. Nibers will count for that number where UCR, you could miss out on those numbers. Okay. And uh, I may have had this before, but I don't remember. Can you just briefly define the difference between aggravated intimidation and simple assault? So an intimidation crime is um, threats, acts of violence, where a simple assault um, was without the use of a weapon, aggravated assault, use of a weapon. Um, so you kind of have your difference, difference in the crime. And assault, of course, is that nothing happened. Once you hit somebody with that, it becomes a battery and therefore a different crime, crime classification. Okay. Um, and were you going to look at the uh, chart as well, the map for Ward 5? Um, if you'd like me to. <laughs> I mean, like I said, I haven't done this for a long time, so I'm not sure what the what the procedure is. Um, I mean, just looking up, at where the crimes are populated seems to be that general downtown area yeah. where I would kind of expect it to be. Yeah, it's actually that that's pretty consistent with what we've seen in prior yes reports. Yeah, we and get could could you just and just for the audience downtown, this is Ward Five, and the area with all the dots. At the, the on the east on the right hand side right. at the bottom that's down that's downtown yeah pretty consistent that's where you have a higher higher population of people higher population of people coming and going as we talked about crime opportunities uh using the crime triangle uh more likely for crime to occur when you get that increased population and, and more more opportunity and the reason i point that out is just that i'm uh, I'm excited you're going to the audience can hear some more about the deeds program. Absolutely. Because we've noticed, and I've had some communication with other downtown residents. We've seen more patrols. We've seen the foot patrols. We've seen engagement. Um, I'm wondering if those numbers, those scores higher there are more because it's more effective enforcement. <laughs> Not and so much there's more crimes, but they're being caught more. And it'd be great eventually if some kind of determination could be made, if those numbers turn out to be right, is it better enforcement? Because I think that would be great news. I mean, I think you'll see some of that, exactly what you're talking about in the deeds report, um, the correlation between officers being down there and um, kind of jumping into that deeds report a little bit. Um, when we're down there and we're doing proactive policing, that does count against NIBRS. So our numbers go up a little bit because we're there and we're doing some proactive enforcement. And typically proactive enforcement, right, is, is more simple based crimes, right? It's your it's your um, misdemeanor violations, it's your traffic violations. But again, that all tends to go towards your NIBRS and your reporting, which brings them up. What I think helps too is um, in certain parts of downtown, there are quite a lot, there's quite a lot of noise uh, overnight, and sometimes correlated with that is criminal activity, fights, noise, drugs, drugs, things like that. Yes. But when we've we've looked out, we look down on that, and we see police cars there. You'd be surprised; it makes a difference to the energy. So proactivity, I think, is the key. It may not; sh it doesn't show up on these, I think, but you need you need um, certainly some praise for that because it's better to head it off. And for people to know that you're going to be there is what will prevent more crime happening yeah. downtown. I mean, the classic Jahari window principle, right? The, if you let a building run down, you're going to tend to bring crime in. If you keep that building up in good shape, you're going to keep crime out. So please keep it up. It's great. Absolutely. It's, good, it's a really good start. Thank you. Absolutely. Can I just ask another question about the statistics? Um, do you know if the neighbors will have like a running average or something? I know it compares the year before and the month before, but like a yearly average. So if, you could really see the change and yeah nibers is actually it's a much better it's it's more difficult on us i'll be honest but in the long run i think once we get it up and running it's gonna be a much more robust system we're gonna be able to dive 
much deeper into the crimes and much easier for the statisticians to take those numbers and do, like you said, a, a month to month, a quarter to quarter, a year to year. Um, so yeah, I think you'll see that as, as we get continue to build these the NIFERS data. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Absolutely. So jumping into deeds, um, So when Chief Nance came, um, she had this idea for the direct engagement enforcement and deployment strategy. Work. Kind of the idea of the DS program is to provide a safe environment to the community and the visitors of the city of Reno. And I'm going to kind of kind of go back a little bit because I'm just not sure um, where you guys are are familiar with the program and and if if the audience is familiar. So I'm going to kind of start at the beginning and quickly go through it, and then I'll even hit to our most recent one that we just uh, ended on Tuesday. Um, and the other part is to create those sustainable practices, right? Um, to go in and do something quickly and then go out. Um, we've really just kind of put a band-aid over that. So we're looking for long-term solutions. We want to find something that works that we can do repeatedly throughout the project. And then we want to engage the entire police department, the community, other departments within the police department to come out and work on this product so project. So we reach across to the different divisions. We reach across the community members um, to come out and help us uh, work the project all together. For our first project, we took the downtown area. Um, we did this in September of 23, and we did a six month version of this to try to iron out exactly what the DEEDS program was gonna look like. Um, I'll tell you, this was a big chunk. It's essentially the entire downtown area, a lot of diversity in crimes and people in the downtown area. And what we found, it was too much. It was just too much. We really couldn't, as we solved one thing, another thing was, was kicking up over here. And it was just too much to really tell if our numbers were working. We had some good success, don't get me wrong. We have very good numbers from what we did. Um, it just wasn't what we were looking for. We were really looking for that sustainability that we were talking about and, and ideas that we could put into practice to do long-term solutions. Looking at some of these numbers, and this kind of goes to what we were, what we were talking about, um, these are area checks, business checks, and you can see our percent change is huge. And that's officer proactivity, right? So the officers in the area checks were 71% more proactive. Um, vehicle checks, 165%. What that does is exactly what we were talking about. The more you're out there, the more you're, you're looking at crimes, um, the crimes tend to decrease. In the next slide, you see that the calls for service citizens the calls for service by the citizens decreased. Um, but you see in the overall, when you looked at the calls for service, the calls for service were up. That's because when the officers go out, we call out on that call and it becomes a call for service. So when you just look at, look at calls for service in general, it's kind of a misleading number because you don't know if it's a reactive response or a proactive response. So by looking at this, we can see that although the calls for service went up, the calls for service in, from the citizens went down. So we can tell that it, we were creating a proactive response and we were stopping calls. Therefore, the citizens didn't have to call in because we are already there, um, hopefully stopping the criminal activity before it occurred. And of course, when you put a bunch of cops down there, like citations, citations doubled, um, the traffic accidents went down and that's what we wanna see, pedestrian accidents went down. Um, but in traffic, we have engineering and, and enforcement um, and education. When you're down there educating, but sometimes the enforcement action is what actually changes um, the dynamics. So learning from going too big um, in September, um, this last month for July, we did um, Second Street. So that's, we went from second to west, from Sierra to uh, Arlington, much, much smaller, just like a six block um, um, area. Reports taken um, decreased by 12.5%. Um, and the officer initiated calls up 112%. Again, that's because once we're down there, right, we're seeing the citizens aren't having to report the crime because we're there, we're taking care of it, we're handling it. And I think one of the greatest things here too is we don't get this very often. We actually had three citizens from the area say, thank you very much for coming down here. We're seeing, your, we're seeing what you're doing. It, it's making a difference. What did we do down there? We had 12 operations. Absent, so yep. can I just, what, can you, what are the um, the red, are they sort of hotspots where there was a lot of activity and the biggest one was the one with yellow in Thank the middle? Thank you. Yes. So that's a heat map. That's what you're using. Um, 
the more as it gets into that yellow color, um, more potential for crime, more crimes happening in that area. So those are kind of our focus areas on that crime. Um, if you correlate that, um, typically that's West 2nd Street Row is a bar. Um, you can imagine the amount of foot traffic and other things that are going on up and down the street as they move from bar to bar. And is, is the one to the left of the, the, the yellow dot, is that the parking lot? Arlington and um, the parking lot would be right next to the red line um, just below kind of where you see the four it's that empty spot where there's there's nothing okay. and the parking lot is tough I'll tell you because of how crimes are reported so you call in from the address across the street I see a fight in the parking lot well what's your address so that's where the, the crime is being reported is from across the street so we've got to be a little bit, when you read the reports, you can actually tell where that crime occurred. Um, we get that usually St. Mary's and Renown are always high crime locations because someone shows up with an injury, they report the crime there so that it ends up. If we don't do our due diligence and correct the call entry on the backside, then those hotspots always come up as the hospitals. Um, so you're seeing kind of the same thing happen here. Uh, the, the other question is you stopped the eastern boundary at Sierra it didn't so it doesn't include Virginia. That's interesting. Why is correct. that? Correct. Just because, like we said on that first one, we just went too big. We couldn't really tell um, what we were doing was working. And this one we want. And since that, we've chosen smaller areas. We're trying to keep them in that six, seven block area so we can really focus on it, um, put the resources in there, and try to see if we can make sustainable changes. And Virginia isn't as much of an issue as. When you look at the, the hotspot map, correct. Okay, interesting. Correct. Yeah. I, I didn't know that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so the engagement we did was um, 12 operations. What do those operations consist of? Um, pedestrian operations by the traffic team, speed um, operations. Um, we bring um, just canines in and do um, meet and greets. We brought the horses in, as you can see, and just walk the area. Um, 19 business checks. We're going, we're going to meet the business owners, seeing what, what are they seeing? Um, do we have the correct contact information? What do they need from us? What can we help them out with? Um, overall, in that one month period, we did over 170 contacts in the area. Um, and we try to be very proactive when we're out there and, and engaging to the community. The enforcement side of, of that, we ended up with, um, as you can see, 12 arrests, 28 traffic citations, four DUIs, um, some pedestrian, like I said, traffic did go down and do its pedestrian operation. If you've ever been down there at night um, between that parking lot you were talking about and the, the bars across the street, you might as well shut the street down because there are just people jaywalking continually, continually. And especially at night, it's it's a hazard. Um, it's a, it's a hot, low light area, hard for drivers to see. They're making a lot of movement already downtown. And then you're putting in pedestrian in the middle of the street. Um, so it is a very hazardous for people to be crossing in those situations. Um, we did some parking citation, towed a vehicle, and then, like I said, we worked with code compliance, and they um, started five compliance cases um, just in that, that one-month period. Some other things we accomplished during that, and I think this, this statistic here is probably one of the biggest ones, is we had two recovered human trafficking victims um, from that area. I mean, that's huge. That's getting somebody out of a life of, of servitude. Um, so that, that's amazing. Uh, 57 service requests were closed. Um, 50 pieces of graffiti. We cleaned the sidewalks in the alley that are right there. We repainted red curbs. Not only did we repaint the red curbs, we met with traffic engineering and looked at the red curb situation along with the pedestrian movement and decided that there probably shouldn't be any parking on the west side of the street. So we painted that entire curb line red, which I think we'll see a big improvement, especially from the policing standpoint. When we're driving by, we can really see what's going on and have a better idea of if we need to take any type of enforcement action. So yet to be seen what happens there, but that's that sustainability piece that we're talking about. And the other cool thing that we did is um, we're starting a, uh, initiating a bar safety program and it's called the Angel Shot. It's um, throughout the country and what this is, is QR codes and different things are put in the bathroom. And then if somebody is having an issue with somebody, maybe they're there on a date and the date is going bad and they just need help, they don't know how to get out of that date or whatever's going on, they can come up to the bartender and ask for an angel shot. That's the secret code. Uh, bartender calls us or calls them a ride so that they can then be with somebody until someone is there to take them out of that situation. Um, really great success, especially in university areas. And as you well know, a lot of those bars right there, a lot of the university kids come down. So I think this has tremendous 
um, possibilities as we build out this program in the downtown area. What's next? So this is our next zone, you know, and you asked about the hotspots. So that's what we do. We come in and we analyze these hotspots. As you can see, this is Lake Street. Um, I believe that's Valley on, no, that's not Valley. What is that? Yes, thank you. Evans on that side, um, just short little five block area of Plaza. Um, we evaluate that locate. We try to for forecast the trends. Um, look at it from, from a perspective of how it affects the community. And then we want to establish a sustainable plan, right? And then the idea is that we repeat all these things over and go over again. It worked on Second Street. Let's see if those ideas will work in this Wonder Lodge zone. Let's see if those ideas will work in our next zone. Um, so that's kind of deeds in a quick overview. I mean, it's very complex, but that's the quick down and dirty version of it. And I think that was my last slide. Do you have questions? Um, when you say you cycle through the different areas, do you come back to the original one as well, or is, is it like one and done? It's not one and done. Um, so what we do, the month we're working on an area, because now we're doing it in one month projects. Like I said, we just ended this that one last, we've got our new one. Um, we look at it for one month. During that month, we have our crime analysts boiling down on what our next three areas should be or potentially be, and then she'll bring them into us and we'll take a vote. Hey, you know what? Um, we get some officers in the room. Oh, I'm seeing this and this. I really think we should do this area because X, Y, and Z. Um, does that mean that once we do an area, it's not going to pop back up? Absolutely not. Um, if you know the Wonder Zone area, if you know the Bar Zone area on 2nd Street, um, I, I can't tell you in my years on Reno PD and then 26 years, how many times we have worked those areas over and over again. Um, you find something that works. Um, and then over the years, things change, right? Um, different management, um, different people moving in, they change access to something and, and you get these spots. So no, absolutely not. Does it mean that it's off the table? Um, if it comes back up, we will certainly reconsider um, targeting that area again. And maybe we move it a little bit, right? Maybe it was Arlington. Maybe it's you know, maybe we take, uh, maybe it's half of that and we're, we go out to Virginia Street, right? Maybe we just adapt that area a little bit. When you have the warnings that's, that are listed here, are they verbally, verbal warnings or are they documented in any way? No, so that typically it's a verbal warning. Sometimes we do document um, the warnings just depending on what it's for. Um, but typically it's just a verbal warning and that's we clear that through a warning. And that could be anything that could have been on a traffic related incident. Probably, I would guess most of those in that area are probably, they're probably open containers. Um, the jaywalking I was jaywalking. talking about, um, my, minor crimes, trying to give the person the benefit of the doubt. Um, How about citations? Do you have courtesy citations for no. warnings? No. No. So that, we can do a written warning, um, but it would just come up as a warning. Okay. Thank you. Abby, do we have any questions online? None at this time, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Good. Well, thank you guys. Yep. Thank you. I'm very encouraged by this. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, moving on to B1 or B2, acceptance of nominations for City of Reno, Ward 5 Community Champions. Wow, somebody is really tall. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is the best part of my day so far. I'm so excited. I We get the honor of recognizing two outstanding individuals who have worked hard to make Reno a brighter place. First, we have um, Vicki Anderson, who was nominated by Jenna Doerr, and she, Jenna was our first community champion in Ward 5. And just because we have some new people here are community champions. Um, they are role models in our area and inspire others to follow in their footsteps. So Vicki is the lead educator. Where are you, Vicki? Come on up. Thank you for being here. You are the lead um, educator at the Child and Family Resource Center at UNR. Happy, is it your first week of school or you're 20 all the time, right? Yes, we are. Oh, you don't get a break. 
Your, your job is even harder. Um, the nomina this nomination highlights Vicki's ability to ensure all children who enter the facility are treated with respect, have a safe environment to thrive, and incorporate parents every step of the way. We have a little gift for you, and we um, welcome you to say a few words if you want to. Well, I just want to thank you for this honor and thank Jenna for nominating me. <laughs> I've been in this field for over 30 years and this is my first recognition. So I just want to say thank you. Ready. I have the best job of everybody. <laughs> you have the hardest <laughs> job of everybody. <laughs> That's it. That's it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Congratulations. Congratulations. And our next nominee is uh, Sharon Elledge, nom nominated by Mr. Gary Cecil. Do you want to? Do you want to do the nomination? I just wanted to say a few things. We have. A number of Sharon's friends here from uh, the montage in downtown. But I, when I first saw this community champion, I I tried to think about what is what does somebody who thrives make communities thrive? What do they do? They bring people together. Well, um, in order to get this done, it took a village. But Sharon was a leading force, still is, and she got businesses together. She got artists together. She got landscape designers together. She got residents together. She got uh, the city together, city and parks. She was incredible in pulling all those people together with a common cause to build a dog park, to make an area of downtown that was light to a degree, or it was bare, and turn it into the beautiful, well-vegetated, well-traveled, uh, well-used it is today. And one of my greatest joys every morning when I walk my dog, he doesn't like being behind the bars, so he doesn't get to go in the dog park, but he sees it. And I see it too. And it, it's called a dog park, but it's a people park too. I cannot tell you how many different people I've seen from different buildings, different backgrounds, uh, tourists who are so fascinated by the wonderful uh, portraits. And Sharon brought community so that downtown feels more like a neighborhood. And that's what we all want. So I'm in awe of her. I'm in awe of the team that she has. I see lots of other volunteers here and credit to you. It's made a huge difference to downtown and it's gonna keep going. So Sharon, thank you so much. Love you. Come on up, I'm extremely honored to accept this award. I'm also extremely humble. It took a village and my support is all behind me. <laughs> and thank you so much, Gary, for nominating me. And uh, I'm just so glad that the park is doing what we hoped it would do. Thank Don't you. Don't you have an event coming up soon? Oh, yes, <laughs> we do. We're having a charity bazaar uh, on August 24th and 25th from eight to five. And it's in the Montage uh, Northwest corner uh, where the hive is going. And the entrance doors are right across from the dog park. So I hope you'll all come over. We have lots of good stuff. We'd like to get a picture with our, our nominees. I don't know. Sharon's taking more contributions.
Councilmember Taylor, will we see you with your two dogs at the dog park sometime? Well, Gary, my dogs are outlaws and they like being behind bars and they're <laughs> there a lot. <laughs> Penny and Charlie love the dog park. Right. And hopefully a, a pollinator park soon, right, Nathan? Right? Yeah. No, I'm not putting you on the spot. We're, we're going to get a pollinator park there, right? Okay. <laughs> Okay, moving on to item B3, Nevada Department of Transportation, I-80 West Reno Landscaping Aesthetics Overview. Good evening. Uh, thank you for having us today. My name is Aaron Lobato. I'm the project coordinator for this uh, Roadway, uh, overseeing the design aspect of this roadway widening project. Um, I will be providing a brief overview of the project scope and my colleague, Matt Parker, will then be presenting a more in depth uh, presentation on the landscape and aesthetics aspect of this project. Um, this project is located in the West Side of Reno, starting from the McCarran Interchange and heads east towards Keystone Avenue. Um, the primary scope of this project is to add a dedicated lane um, for those entering on the West McCarran on-ramp interchange traveling east towards Keystone Avenue. And in order to achieve this, we're gonna be shifting the existing two lanes towards the median um, to create uh, effectively that third lane going all the way through to Keystone Avenue. Um, in doing so, we're gonna to have to be widening that Stoker Bridge structure that's uh, over on IED. Um, we're also gonna be doing uh, rehab on four bridges. This includes the McCarran, inter the McCarran Bridge, the Stoker Bridge, the Keystone Bridge, and the cemetery bridge that goes over I-80 itself. Um, in addition to that, we're also gonna be doing some lighting updates to in increase uh, some of the visibility out there. And more importantly, we're gonna be um, erecting some sound walls along the corridor to kind of alleviate some of that noise for those residents that live along that. Um, we're also gonna be doing some minor hydraulic improvements to facilitate some of the flows as a result of the widening. Um, and the landscape aesthetics and portion of it that Matt will shortly be talking on. Um, the most recent project also that we had, this project went up for to the, for, uh, excuse me, the project was up for review for the board and it was awarded. So the contractor has a notice to proceed and you guys should start seeing construction sometime late September, early October. So that's my little spiel and I'll hand it over to Matt who will be then presenting the landscape aesthetics portion of it. Good evening. Let me just make sure I got this. Good. All right. My name is Matthew Parker. I'm a landscape architect with the Nevada Department of Transportation. And as Ann mentioned, I'll be going over the landscape and aesthetics portion of the project. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to save them towards the end and I'll field them as best I can. I'd like to start with first discussing our uh, landscape and aesthetics program. Uh, back in 2000, the uh, State Transportation Board embarked on an effort to develop a master plan to provide a series of policies and guidance and standards for how we approach aesthetics on our highway system. And uh, with oversight, with an assistant advisory board, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, we were able to publish a master plan in 2002. And using that as a foundation to work off of, we then launched into a series of corridor studies. And uh, in collaboration with uh, uh, stakeholders and local government agencies, we developed a series of corridor plans that provide a much more detailed, uh, in-depth look at uh, our guiding design for the various highway corridors in our state. And then with uh, using the master plan and these corridor studies, we can then really inform our designs on a project-to-project -project basis, which is what I'll be going over tonight. And uh, as Aaron mentioned, we go into construction uh, later on this year. So currently where we stand right now is in between steps three and four. This is a really uh, basic overview of the project limits. Uh, everything you see in purple is where we'll be making uh, improvements. McCarran Boulevard, that intersection stands as like the western boundary with Keystone Avenue being that eastern boundary. If you've driven along the I-80, I'm sure you've noticed we have a very strong flora and fauna theme. Uh, that is uh, you know, a, uh, something that was agreed upon through various 
uh, public outreach efforts years and years ago. And so, of course, naturally, we're bringing that into this project as well to continue on this theme and uh, provide a lot of continuity between all these different locations along the I-80 corridor. Another way we provide that continuity is with a color scheme. So we have a pre-approved color palette that's in our corridor plan for Interstate 80. And uh, we selected a few colors from that palette to use in this project as well. You may have recognized some of these colors are already used on a lot of the bridges in, uh, along the I-80. So uh, these colors will be coming through the project as well. And again, it really just kind of brings the whole uh, corridor together with a, a, a very cohesive theme and look. Here's an example of some of the, the plants we'll be using on the project. This isn't the entire plant palette. This is just a, a few select species I want to bring up to really give a flavor of what we're going to be putting out there. Uh, we have uh, species that will be flowering. We'll have species that will have a deciduous fall leaf color. Uh, but then we also have evergreens to provide that lasting texture and color all throughout the year, even in winter. So at the end of the day, we'll have a very dynamic landscape uh, that's changing, but also something that look good year round as well. Um, the projects that I'm going to be, or I'm breaking down the project into a couple of sections I'll be going over. So I'll be discussing the McCarran interchange, the Keystone interchange, and then also this long corridor we have in between. The McCarran intersection, for those of you who have driven through, I'm sure you've noticed that uh, it, it needs a little love. There's uh, the paint's old, stained on the bridges. We've got a lot of barren patches and landscaping, some uh, dead and dying plant material. And we have some erosion problems. Um, a lot of that dirt is sloughing off those slopes onto the sidewalk and into the street. Uh, so the solutions for these problems is going to be repainting the bridge and slope paving, uh, repairing and updating the irrigation system, removing dead and dying plant material, installing new trees and shrubs, and then very importantly, installing a decorative rock to uh, prevent any further erosion. So we'll have a nice rock ground cover. Again, going back to that flora and fauna theme that we want to bring into this project, for the McCarran intersection, we'll be bringing in the western fence lizard. And uh, this will be done through a series of uh, steel cut or uh, steel image panels that are cut into the shape of the lizard. And these will be attached to the slope paving underneath the bridge. Um, that, that rendering in the top left corner, that was an original approach where we were going to sandblast the concrete. And we then later changed direction and figured it'd be better to have these steel panels uh, look better and, and stand the test of time a little better as well. Keystone intersection has a lot of the same problems as McCarran. Uh, got dead and dying plant material, barren patches, the paint's old, and erosion issues as well. So it's the same solutions of bringing a new plant material, repainting the bridges, retaining walls, updating the irrigation system, and again, having that uh, decorative rock installed to prevent future erosion. The animal we're bringing into this intersection for the flora and fauna theme is going to be the jackrabbit. Same approach as McCarran. Uh, these are going to be um, steel panels that we cut into the shape of the rabbit and then powder coat for a color and then attach onto the retaining walls. And we'll be painting blades of grass on the retaining wall behind the rabbit. In between McCarran and Keystone, we've got this long corridor and it's a little bit of a different approach here. As Aaron mentioned, we've got sound walls going in, but we have very limited space to work on either side of the highway to install these walls. So the construction of the sound walls is going to impact a lot of what's currently there. So a lot of those trees that are there, the rock, and even the irrigation system is going to be heavily impacted. So as a part of, um, of building these walls, we're going to have to come back in and uh, after the walls are built and uh, modify the irrigation system, bring in new plant material and new rock. Uh, and it's important at this point to, to, to bring up that uh, generally what happens on a construction project like this is the trees are one of the first things to go and one of the last things to be replaced at the end. So there is gonna be a period where you're gonna see a lot of trees coming out. Don't worry, we have new trees coming in, but they'll be coming in at the end of the project. The flora and fauna thing we're bringing into the sound walls is uh, fish swimming through the Truckee River. So if those fish look familiar, you may have seen them before. They are uh, the same fish that are uh, represented over in Sparks, uh, steel Im uh, image panels attached to retaining walls. So again, bringing more of that continuity and making sure our corridor you know, has consistency, bringing them in here as well as a pattern on these walls. We also have these abstract uh, ribbons representing flowing water, and then these uh, abstract uh, ripple patterns representing more of the um, slower moving parts of the river. We got fish biting, bugs landing to get those really cool ripples. 
And the reason why we want to bring a really abstract texture into these walls is because when the walls are built, they're going to be the panels, the, the wall panels are going to be shifting up and down as needed to meet grade. And uh, it's not going on a flat surface. So uh, we want to give a pattern that looks nice, tells a story. But at the same time, when these panels shift up and down as needed, it's not as noticeable. The, the, the abstraction of the patterns kind of hide those shifts. So it's a, a design, an intentional design decision we made to uh, make the wall look better, we think. And lastly, in between the two intersections, we have two bridges. A first is a cemetery bridge. Uh, it's, uh, the, the painting's not as old on that one. It's our quarter colors. It lo looks great as is, so we're gonna leave that one as, as it is. And then uh, the Stoker Bridge, um, as Aaron mentioned, there's gonna be some widening to the inside. And as you can see, there's the existing paint is patchy and old. So we'll be going through and repainting all that concrete slope paving and then repainting the bridge as well. And uh, that's all I have. So be welcome to take any questions you have. Uh, one question, the funds for all this, is it federal grants or a combination of things or? It's yeah. state highway funds, so it's federal funding with a uh, 5% state match. Nice, thank you. I'm definitely excited about it. I. I mean, the first thing, because it said aesthetics and whatnot, I was like, are they widening the road? Because last night at 5 o'clock, it was completely backed up. And so I went down 4th Street to go around the whole whole way to get down here. Um, so I'm glad to see that's getting widened. Um, entering into Reno should be three lanes, I would think. And then it all looks really great. Um, just don't put up put the sound walls upside down. like. <laughs> Like Spanish Spring, I'll make sure of it. <laughs> but I mean, it looks really nice, and I'll be excited to see all those improvements. Thank you. I would just echo that. Um, my wife likes to drive back roads. I like to go on the freeway going. So um, I go up that incline quite a lot. I think it would be good to have more lanes because you get a lot of semis, even with the lanes there are now, that still like to pass other ones, and that can cause a slowdown. So I think yeah. that's good. Um, I love the designs. Uh, my wife almost fell off her chair when I showed them today. She loves them, and they look. They, I I really applaud that. I think it's neat. And you did take public input for that. That came from the community. Uh, yeah, there was a, a stakeholder meeting where we we had those designs brought up, and then the uh, our public outreach in last year in two thousand twenty three. Um, we uh, uh, it was about the sound walls. So. You know, I think for people coming like through town. And there's going on to Salt Lake City or wherever, or even those where they're coming from California and they land in, in Reno. Just as you come above the rise, you see the downtown for the first time at a point when you're coming on close to this particular area. So I think that it adds a bit of pizzazz as well in terms of us as a tourist city to show that we care what it looks like even uh, on, the, on the freeway. Yeah, um, I so I, I applaud that effort too. But um, really nice designs. I like love the jackrabbit. Thank you, Thank you very much. It's obvious you put a lot of thought into this. The, the notion of having a color palette that goes all the way across is just, in my view, admirable. Oh. Thank you very much. Thank you. And do we have any questions online by chance, Emmy? No, Mr. Chair. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Appreciate it. So now moving on to item B4, informational presentation regarding capital improvements. All right, good uh, evening, Chair Harvey, uh, members Chiselman and Cecil, Nathan Elliott, Parks and Recreation Director for the record. It's been a while since I've talked uh, to y'all and this is my first time uh, presenting um, kind of our update for capital improvements in the area. Um, we're just going around doing doing the NAB tour right now. So as you can see, I have a, quite a big following that came tonight to hear the parks presentation. So I was excited about that. Half of them weren't here for me, but uh, anyway, that's a joke. That's a joke. I'll be here all night. Uh, so anyway, just here to talk about uh, capital improvements and uh, give you a little uh, brief lesson on, on where some of our funding comes from to do the capital improvements and then also to build new parks. So 
Um, I'll spend a little bit of time on that because I just think it's important to understand where some of the challenges are in funding those, those opportunities. So uh, RCT or residential construction tax is uh, the funding mechanism through development that uh, should fund new parks that uh, are needed as a, a part of the development or uh, new homes going in. Um, this uh, last substantive change for a residential construction tax occurred in 1987, where it raised the cap to $1,000 or 1% per dwelling unit. Um, it's important to just understand that's, uh, I know you can do the math, it's, uh, it's about 37 years. Uh, it's been a while, so right? So, um, $1,000 or 1% 1 uh, kind of capped out in 1995 when the median home price reached $100,000. So I uh, just want to clarify many times that has not changed in, in quite a while. So um, some of the allowed uses are new construction, which is the primary uh, design for that or the intention for that. But it also allows us to improve or expand existing parks and amenities, which you'll see is kind of what we're limited to doing at this point with that funding source. What's not allowed is daily maintenance, uh, ongoing maintenance, uh, operational expenses, things like facilities and pools, and we can't use it for parks that are larger than 25 acres. And then another uh, piece of that is that it's restricted to the area that the development occurred in. So we have uh, about six districts and a few smaller districts around uh, the city that allow us to uh, collect and then distribute those, those funds. Uh, so just another little snapshot. Um, in, since 1990, we've uh, added 27 parks, 25 miles of trails. Uh, we've expanded seven parks and added two rec centers. Um, you can't see all the way up at the top there, but the median price per acre to develop parkland uh, increased about 529% from 1990 to now. The median home price has increased by approximately 970% in that same time. And then just once again, it hasn't changed uh, RCT and the cap has not changed in 37 years. Nothing's gotten cheaper. That's the message. Nothing's gotten cheaper and we don't have a great funding source to, to help build that. So um, just another uh, example here. This is something that we uh, presented as a potential BDR for council to consider is changing some of the language for residential construction tax, not even necessarily to increase the fee, although that should be considered, um, but even just giving some flexibility to build regional resources. As a lot of the developments are uh, building neighborhood parks because of this, this is not a, a viable resource to do that. So um, what it would cost to build a 10 acre park um, in 2023 would be 7,400 homes. Whereas in 1987, we were able to develop uh, the Virginia Lake Park um, with just 1,752 roofs being added. So here's another just kind of example of some parks that have been built over the last 20 plus years, 30 plus years and, and how those were uh, cost per acre and the project cost total. Um, these are our fund balances for residential construction tax. And again, this is important because a lot of uh, the funding for what we'll be presenting in a, in a second is coming from that fund, um, is that residential construction fund. Um, Ward five is primarily in district two, just for awareness, which we'll show in a second. Uh, this is just the slide we use as an example of uh, if it was not restricted to uh, the development area, uh, 25, 26 million over the last 10 years came in. So if we were looking at regional resources, this would be the pot of money we could have for um, Reno proper or the Reno city limits. So sorry, just moving through quick. I just think that's important to know a little history lesson on RCT and when folks ask about why can't we have new parks and new things, um, this is one of the challenges that we have to figure out is, is a funding mechanism for that. So, uh, but just kind of sharing some of the projects we are able to accomplish. Um, Sky Country Park up off of McCarran, and uh, I guess it's just uh, west of Kings Row, I believe, is, uh, or no, east of Kings Row, is um, scheduled for an expansion with a playground replacement, uh, and we're going to expand and add to the dog park. Um, upgrade sidewalks and trails, and then uh, find a new purpose for the volleyball court. So we'll be looking for input from, from this board and from the community on what would be a, a good opportunity for the volleyball court, even if it's just to rebuild it and, and make sure it's usable at all times. Um, another big component that we're bringing in is the Hilltop Park lighting upgrade. Those, those lights are the old style and some of the poles are starting to, to loosen and, and becoming a hazard, uh, but getting a, a more intense uh, intent and focused um, LED setup where it will not have so much wash and disturb the neighbors at, for night practices up there at Hilltop Park. 
some capital maintenance projects, which is another fund that council has recently started funding just in the last three or four years to, to give us a significant uh, um, opportunity to make some basic improvements, uh, things like uh, hardscape repairs, um, uh, repairs to fencing, shelter installations, things like that. Um, are, are things that we've been uh, working for. So a big a big piece there is at Northwest and Clayton, there's gonna be a lot of small improvements there. Some seating areas around the playgrounds have been a request, uh, some, some path repairs. Uh, we're also looking at uh, replacing a light pole there that um, fell over recently in the last year and a half. So uh, some pieces there. We'll be all over the city looking to install shade structures on playgrounds. So our playgrounds are more usable for youth uh, and families during the summertime. Um, there was an intent at one point to uh, add a shelter at Lake Park. Um, after talking to the community, we've kind of changed course there. So we'll be looking to reallocate those resources into Lake Park and then into the uh, Ward 5 parks around the area. Uh, so here's a shot of Sky Country. Um, you can see that kind of undeveloped trail space there to the uh, kind of northeast-ish um, of that shot is, is where we'll spend a lot of the time developing in addition to playgrounds. Playgrounds are extremely expensive nowadays, 500 to 750,000 for a pretty modest playground. It's, it's not the ones you travel for, but, um, they're very expensive. And so that's a big chunk of it, but we do also dog parks on the other hand are a fairly affordable amenity that, um, really help activate a space and give folks a space to, to bring their, their dogs, um, to do the stuff that you do in a dog park. Um, and then that trail improvements, you can already see there, but, um, trying to add, add some components there and then hardscape improvements as areas age. We want to make sure that our, our playgrounds are accessible, our, our paths are accessible. And then Hilltop Park, just an image of that. And again, that's mostly focused on, on the lighting elements there. Um, it's right up, it's right on the Hilltop. You can see it from, you know, almost anywhere when those lights are on. So we'll be improving, uh, improving those lights there. Some urban forestry updates too, as a part of their space. Uh, you can see there, um, Las Brisas Boulevard. There's there's a, a few coming in the next uh, in the next several months as we do pruning, and then there's also uh, Arbor Day we're trying to move into for next year in Ward Five and do a project in Ward Five where we've hit Ward Four and Ward Two in the past. So, anyway, just a quick update. Um, hopefully, we'll. I, I, Wanted to share the uh, the reality that the money doesn't go as far as we wish it would. Um, and so we're looking for for opportunities through the Parks, Recreation, and Open Space Plan, which I think I spoke about last time I was here, to see how we can and find those new funding sources to, to help enhance our park system um, at a regional level as well as at a neighborhood level. So, all right, with that, any questions? I have one question for you. When new developments putting in new housing in a particular location. Does the city impose requirements for new parks for certain densities? Uh, so we have we have some desired standards as a part of the uh, the Reno vision or reimagine Reno uh, master plan that occurred. It's not in any, um, I guess, firm language, I would say, but a lot of the developers really are looking to try to um, be a solution in that space until there's a different type of mechanism for, for cities to fund parks. One of the challenges, even if they built us the most beautiful park ever, it's a challenge to maintain it. And that ongoing cost is uh, there. So a lot of, a lot of the developers have been uh, good partners in, in building the park and then setting it up for an HOA maintenance program. It's, it's important to remember like, if there's if there's a small park in Somerset, it's not likely that someone in South Reno is going to come all the way up to go on a playground or pass five or six playgrounds in their community um, to go play on a standard playground. So, if we can get the HOAs to maintain that, we think it's fair because the neighborhood's going to use it, not the whole city. Thank you. Any online questions, Bryce? So why hasn't that one percent been increased since '87? I know it's a new tax. Nobody wants new taxes. Is that why? Uh, I think I think that's probably part of it. I think it's um, it is another it's another thing. It it's it's been a long time, and so I think it's fair to look at. It's fair to ask the question. Another opportunity that is uh, a mechanism the state has provided is development impact fees, which are a little more um, rigid on usage. It really can only be used to develop new parks uh, and new amenities. It can't be used to replace or anything like that. But that is an option we have. And that's, again, it's one of the things in the pros plan we'll bring to council, we'll bring to the Rec and Parks Commission. 
and uh, at least voice it and see what the the feeling is. Is it right for Reno? Is it right for Reno right now? Um, and see and see where that goes. So we do have some options there. Another thing is a park district, which is a possibility as well. Not, that money's got to come from somewhere. So there's no fun way to say it, but um, you know we present the options and then we have some choices to make. I remember your last time you were here, you were talking about the maintenance and how expensive it was, and so. And then to the people that had public comment, they were asking why couldn't that piece on 7th Street become a park? And it's just that the money's not there. And I don't know what the church is doing, like selling that place or whatnot, but uh, that's just... And then my other, my last question or point is that Sky Country Park, you guys are doing a new trail system. Um, can it be interconnected and go up to the Keystone Trailhead? That, that's the goal. Um, one thing that's coming to the Rec and Parks Commission next week uh, on the 20th is the Truckee Meadows Trails Plan, which is really going to focus on incorporating and, and connecting regional trails. A lot of the developments are, again, doing a good job of connecting trails within the development, but how do we make sure we have access to get to trails outside of the development so that you can go from, you know, uh, Mayberry Park all the way up into the mountains and things like that. So, and the county's got a great trail programmer and planner as well, Christine, Christina Thayer, and uh, they're working on that as well. So um, the hope would be, yes, that, that anytime there's a regional trail or a regional asset that we can connect them through development. Great. Thank you. Um, in terms of the rec residential construction tax, is that, just germane to Nevada, or is that something that is a limitation in many other jurisdictions across the country? I don't know if there's a, uh, I, I'm sure there's a similar mechanism in other spaces. Uh, the states that I'm familiar with are typically doing development impact fees, which we use for police and fire, but we don't currently use for parks, which are easier to adjust based on cost of development. Um, you know, it's, it's still a per house fee, uh, but it can be adjusted based on the cost to develop an acre. So that per acre cost goes up. It's you can adjust that within every two to three years on the development impact fee side to keep up with that inflation and that um, desire to improve it. So it still goes through council. It has to be approved. Um, uh, but it is it is a mechanism that's a little more common in my experience in other states. But um, RCT has its benefits. It's just been kind of capped for a long time. If I remember correctly, I, I think it was you, but I'm not sure. It may have been your predecessor, but um, there was was talk about almost benchmarking the expenditures. I don't know whether it was capital or whether it was operating um, to other places around the country because so many people cut that because of the, the recession in 2008, 2009, and they were slow to bring it back because there's so many, so many things that needed to be covered. Was that you? Is, have you looked at benchmarks with us? Are we how are we doing compared to a comparable city somewhere else? Sure, the pros plan. It, it could have been me. It definitely could have been Jamie, my predecessor. But um, it, it's been a pretty common theme since two thousand eight. So um, it is. It continues to be a challenge. And the benchmarks. Um, there's always going to be comparables that say we're doing great. And there's going to be other ones that say we're behind um, and really just benchmarking against ourselves in 2008, where we were at $23 million as a department budget had twice as many staff. And of course, everything was less expensive then. Um, so 23 million, then we're at about 17 million, 17, five now. And that's with the additional costs of the Moana. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's still that challenge. So it's, we still have priorities. I look at that. We have $17 million of opportunity. We have to prioritize and try to be, try to do what we can well. And again, that goes to, there's been a lot of people who've stepped up. RYSA has helped take over youth sports and help support youth sports when the city had cuts in that area. Again, the developers helping to build neighborhood parks that um, the folks who live there can walk to versus the city having to build and maintain it. So um, we're, we're doing our best with that. And I know people are pitching in, but um, you know, it just, it's, it's again, bringing the uh, solutions or a solution and see if it's right. Or otherwise we just continue to live in the solution we're currently in. So, yeah, but, uh, but yeah, those benchmarks are in the pros plan. If, if you're interested in, in knowing more about that. It just, it's, it just it just seems like a real Sophie's choice because for everyone we see that you you're trying to do something for capital or otherwise there's others that you can't it's it must be a very very tough decision and I applaud you for having to go through that oh it's not easy no it's it's um it's a great it's a great job it's a great thing to serve in Parks and Rec is an amazing field and uh, I think we saw that during the 
during COVID where people got to go outside and rediscover the parks again and how important it was in that time. And it didn't stop being that way. I think, I think we've seen the numbers increase over the years uh, and maintain that after COVID. So, uh, but it, glad to serve and happy to try to bring the solutions forward and, and we can make some decisions. Uh, just finally, is Jerry, Jerry Wages still on your Parks and Commission? He is. Yeah, yeah. Jerry's on yeah, the commission. I have coffee with him occasionally, and he really has enjoyed the infusion of energy and enthusiasm and new ideas that you brought. He's so, hard to keep up with, I'll tell you that. So, And we've got Mac over here. Oh, Mac yeah. Dennis is our, our Rec and Parks Commissioner, too. <laughs> Ward 5 resident, as am I. So um, thank you. Thank you for the time. Appreciate thank it. Thank you very much. Thanks thank for you your very work. much. Thank you. All right, we'll move on to item B5, Neighborhood Advisory Board Resolution Update. Hello, everyone. Jenica Finnegan, Council Relations Manager uh, for the record, here to brief you on updating the Neighborhood Advisory Board Resolution um, in preparation for the new ward boundaries coming into effect. So um, also here, happy to hear any feedback that you have on the resolution, proposed resolution. Uh, and I will give you an overview of some of the changes. So to start off, here's a little background and timeline of the history of the Neighborhood Advisory Boards. Uh, they came about in 94. There have been a few updates to them since then. And then, of course, Council adopted uh, the ordinance to create a six ward in September of last year. So in the month of August, I'm also on the Neighborhood Advisory Tour this month, <laughs> um, going to each NAB uh, and presenting this presentation. Uh, so planning on taking this resolution to council in September, uh, ahead of the new ward boundaries going into effect. So these are some of the priority changes. These are the must do's essentially. Uh, so the, the one specific to adding and including a six neighborhood advisory board into this resolution. So the first one is just ensuring that the new resolution goes into effect at the same time as the new ward boundaries go into effect and our old resolution is repealed. Uh, that second one there is just creating the ward six NAB to make sure that each uh, uh, ward is represented by a functional NAB. Uh, the third one there is to update the ward map to reflect the new the new um, city map. The fourth one there is the impact of the transition to the six wards on the neighborhood advisory boards and how it affects sitting members. So I'm going to go into that a little bit more, but this one clarifies term limits, eligibility, and, and really outlines a transition plan for sitting members. Uh, so here we have a little... Um, diagram of what your choices are, essentially. So new ward boundaries go into effect. I'm going to start on the left-hand side, and we'll go through each scenario. Uh, so if you live in a different ward uh, and were redistricted into a different ward during that process, uh, and you want to serve on a different NAB, what you would do is submit a resignation to the current NAB and then apply to serve on the desired NAB that best represents you. The second option, you live in a different ward, but you want to stay on your current NAB and you feel that that is the NAB that best represents you. Uh, you're eligible to continue serving on your current NAB for the remainder of your term. And then the third option is you live in the same ward, so you are eligible to, to continue serving on the NAB as desired uh, for the remainder of your term as well. So those are kind of the three scenarios that we're looking at. Uh, as we dove into the resolution, we noted some opportunities to, to uh, bring the NABs um, into more consistency across all of them. And so these are a few functional changes that staff is also recommending. So the first one is regarding eligibility requirements. Um, staff is recommending that uh, uh, individuals can serve on a NAB and another City of Reno Board and Commission, but they wouldn't rec we won't recommend that um, uh, a member serve be able to serve on two neighborhood advisory boards at the same time. So you can serve on a NAB and Parks and Rec, for example, but not Ward 1 and Ward 6. The second one there is just clarifying some uh, language regarding alternate members. We don't have a ton of alternates at this point in time, but it is speckled throughout the resolution in six different sections of the current one. So we're just kind of making it topical and more organized, recommending that alternates, if they want to become a full member of the body, go to council through the regular appointment process. 
The third one there is an absence removal clause. This is essentially a no call, no show. So we want to make sure that NABs are full of active members who are participating regularly, uh, ensuring that you all are able to meet quorum. Uh, so that one is we're recommending if there's a no call, no show, three meetings in a row that that member may be able to be removed. The fourth one there is applicability of RMC 2.20, which is our code of ethics per Reno Municipal Code. And so as public appointees, we want to make sure that uh, you are aware of your um, uh, responsibilities to, to our code of ethics. The last one there is staff is recommending that at the first regularly scheduled meeting of the year for the, each NAB that you elect a chair and vice chair, just to again, ensure consistency across all of the neighborhood advisory boards. Uh, in addition to those functional changes, we also are recommending a few cleanup and administrative changes. We've taken a lot of these from uh, other boards and commissions across the city, including the Financial Advisory Board, uh, as well as the HRC. So removing gendered language, uh, this is in alignment um, with our, our mission to be more inclusive uh, and our branding standards. Combining provisions related to development projects. Again, this is in three different areas in our current resolution. So making sure that the, oh, those are all brought into one distinct section. Clarifying language related to term limits. Clarifying resignation protocol. This is just, we would like for it to be codified that you would submit a, a letter of resignation via email uh, to your staff liaison. So we can log that with the city clerk. Uh, clarifying that service on the NAB is uncompensated. We pulled this from HRC. Uh, the next one, outlining duties of the chair, we've taken this from council rules. Uh, and then clarifying the agenda creation process and adding some legal disclaimers. So I think you all had a copy of the draft uh, resolution. And so I'm happy to answer any questions or hear any feedback that you have today. <laughs> I'm the odd one out here. Um, so I do... I live in a different ward. I want to serve on the ward one now. Is there a, a specific time or the best time that I should submit my resignation for this one? Because we've only got three members right now and then submit for ward one. That's a good question. Um, so we will want to make sure that there is continuity in your service and making sure that we bring those applications forward for the city council to approve appointments at the appropriate time. Um, I would recommend you could submit an application at any time for the ward one, and then it would be incumbent upon that member to bring those forward to the city council. Um, so I would recommend applying in November, late in November. November, yeah. Okay. And, I should... and then we can get those agendized in December, likely. And I should resign from this one probably after the October NAB meeting then. That tracks, yeah. Yeah? Yes. Yeah. And I, do that I don't know, through... do you know what the date is for the November Ward 5 NAB, Abby, by chance? And we can talk through your specific situation. November 12th. November 12th, so. Oh. Both of those are done through the resignation and the reapplication through our council liaison. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Okay. The the application you should be able to find online, and then you'll submit your resignation to to Miss Mayorga. Okay. Um, attendance by Zoom is still acceptable then. Absolutely. Okay. All right. And finally, I know it's not on your list, but I'd highly recommend. I I don't know. There will be a whole new bunch of people maybe that will be interested. Hopefully, for all of them. I really think some more base, some more training is required, like looking up things on a cellar. Um, mm. Not everybody knows where to go for that. A little bit more about the administrative code and things like that. Not a mm. great deal, but it's more than we've had. It's helpful. Yeah, I think um, it's an opportunity for us to kind of reset and, and establish a sort of NAB um, handbook, essentially, for members that might be helpful um, to kind of get you acquainted with the operations of the city and be able to, to do some of those functional um, research on your own end and be more knowledgeable about that coming in. Great. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Any other questions? Nice. Okay, thank you. Thank you.
so now we are on to project development, uh, development project item C. Yes, Mr. Chair, and we did receive a public comment for this item, so I'm going to call up the public commenters first before we hear the presentation. Okay. Um, up first, we have Mr. TJ. For the commenters, would that be a preference? We can do that. Okay, we'll do the presenters first, and then we'll do our public comment. All right, good evening. Thank you. My name is Eric Hasty. I'm with Witter Rogers. I'm representing the applicant, um, AMH Holmes, who is also in, in attendance here tonight, and we'll be going over our project with you. All right, so this project is located at 2400 West 7th Street. It's on approximately 3.72 acres. It's currently owned by the Episcopal Diocese of Nevada, but the property has been listed for sale. Um, it's been for sale for several years. And I just wanna point out that this is an infill site that is currently being served by the city of Reno services, as well as the city of Reno utilities. Um, this, this infill site is also located within the McCarran ring. And um, these infill sites are um, highlighted in the Reimagine Reno master plan as um, priority sites for redevelopment. So looking at the master plan, you can see that the master plan is really uh, consistent with what the adjacent properties are. Um, the, the master plan is single family residential. And then the zoning, which is located on the right, um, that is SF8 or single family residential, eight dwelling units per acre. And this is also consistent with the adjacent properties. There is a portion um, that is across from the Highland Ditch that is located within Washoe County, unincorporated Washoe County, but it's, that's, that is within the sphere of influence. And so that's why it has the City of Reno Master Plan designation. So what we are proposing, or we are requesting with this application is a tentative map and a major site plan review. The tentative map uh, consists of 28 lot subdivision. And then the cluster development is going to ask for a reduction in the uh, lot size. And part of this cluster development means that you have to dedicate the portion that's not gonna be used for lots um, and right away to as, as open space. And that with this development will create about 1.32 acres of common area. So I just like to point out that we're not asking for increase in density. The SF8 zoning allows for 29 lots uh, based on the 3.72 acres. Um, we're proposing 28 lots. We are reducing, we are asking for a reduction of the minimum lot size from 6,000 square foot to th uh, approximately 3,000 square feet. And this is really just the, um, the width of, of the lot itself. It's going from, we're asking for a reduction of si from 60 feet to 35 feet. So the minimum lot setbacks that are um, allowed within the SF8 zoning designation, we're not asking to change those. We will be complying with those with the additional uh, reduction in lots. So a few things that the cluster development um, does does provide and was was consideration of for design when, when designing this, you know, it being an infill site, um, we understand that there are adjacent neighbors and um, to in, in order to, to to kind of accommodate that and provide a little additional screening as well as separation from those lots. We have common area, which is proposed. There's um, along the western boundary, um, we're proposing currently right now 17 feet and up to 23 feet along this, this boundary where the, these homes are the closest. Um, this will be landscaped as well as providing a separation of the backyards. You won't have uh, separate uh, backyards right up against each other. And then with the 20 foot setback for the house, the, the addition of the common area as well as the 20 foot setback give about a 35 or more setback to the current property lines. And this is kind of consistent with the lot. If you look at the, what is currently along the Western boundary, these range from 30 to, you know, 35 feet for a majority of them. So 
looking at the on-site circulation that we have proposed, the street is just going to be a single street with a cul-de-sac. Um, it's aligning with the, uh, the intersection that's across from it to help with safety as well as ingress and egress. Um, that's Rhode Island Drive to the north. And then the two private driveways to access a majority of the sites along the south, southwestern or southeastern border. Um, those are gonna be private drive aisles um, that will be part of the common area open space. On street parking is allowed with this right away width. Um, with the space, if that's the, how much parking is a lot, is actually um, going to be able to be on there is about seven spaces with the spacing of the driveway. So code requires 56 spaces and that's based on the, um, the square footage of the house. And so each one of these houses is proposed to be under 2,500 square feet. So each one would require two spaces. And then with the addition of the, the driveways, as well as the two car parking garage and the on-street parking, that gives us about 119 spaces that we are proposing for this whole development. Um, sidewalk is also be on both sides and connecting to the existing sidewalk on 7th Street. When you're looking at traffic that would be generated from this project, we refer to the ITE manual. Um, this anticipates 27 a.m peak hour trips and 32 p.m. peak hour trips. But with the current use of the church and comparing that to what could be based on the square footage of the existing church, that is a reduction in the PM peak hour trips. Um, there's about 158 that could come with that church um, during events and, and, and gatherings. So looking at the houses themselves and, and how they're designed, we are proposing several different models with different floor plans, as well as different types of elevations. Um, these, these range from, you know, I said all of them are gonna be under 2,500 square feet and about 1,800 square feet. You know, three to five bedrooms for each floor plan, depending on what you'll have. And a minimum two car garage, there's some options to have a third car garage, if that's fine. So, also with this pro property, looking at the elevation change um, between the current residents along the western boundary and the proposed lots, you can see from this, I plan I added a little bit of color to kind of help show what you're looking at. So this is a cross section of cross section B here. This is the existing resident um, and the proposed two story, so the, the house that's here is a one story, the proposed two story homes will be set much lower, ranging from 16 to 10 feet, depending on the where you're at along this Western property boundary. And if you think about it, a 12 foot distance is like a one story level of the house. So most of these will be much lower than the um, existing homes and, and the, and the Everett Street, that is our Everett Drive, that is located to the west. So just to, just to recap, we are pr proposing a, you know, a tentative map for 28 lots. It is involved with the cluster development. The cluster development will help um, provide that transition with the smaller lots that we're asking for to the existing neighbors. Um, we are understanding that they're are some concerns as well. And so prior to going to the planning commission, which is tentatively scheduled for September 18th, uh, we will be hosting, um, an applicant will be hosting a meeting as well, where we're gonna invite anybody who was noticed. We got the mailing list from the city of Reno. We will be sending notices out um, at a meeting to discuss more aspects of the projects. Anything that we hear tonight, we can um, address during that meeting and um, and if you guys have any comments too, I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. So thank you. Um, I'm all for infill. I think that's what we need to do. I mean, there's definitely, you know, the price of houses and all that. Um, there was a recent project that was at Mayan and Grand Point way and they stuffed, it was like 78 homes in a tiny little portion and it, Really, for that one, it came down to parking for me. Um, do you know how long the driveways are on this? 
Yeah. The, <clears throat> so from the, the back of the sidewalk to the driveway, the minimum is going to be 20 feet, which is required by code to have to be counted as a, as a parking space too. Um, so minimum is going to be 20 feet. Okay. And you said they can park on the street because there's enough in between the two houses. So you're not like blocking your neighbor's driveway. Exactly. Yeah. So that's where that, that seven parking spaces comes in. We measured, um, there were some where they were, they were pretty close. Right. And it's really going to depend on the final design of where the, the driveways are spaced. Um, but currently with this site plan, there's an additional set, uh, room for additional seven on the, on the street parking. I guess it is hard for me to see that like everybody only has two cars. Like I have teenagers and they have cars and there's three or four cars at each house. And then they park. I don't know where they're going to park because I don't think you can park on seventh street, but um, I just see them overflowing in the other areas. So that would definitely be a concern for me. Um, are they going to be for rent or to buy? Um, so the applicant could come speak to that a little bit more, but they are supposed to be for rent. They are to be sold. Well, it seems like that's, I mean, a lot of developments are going that way now where they're not even selling the houses anymore. They're just kind of renting them out. Is it a local developer that's doing this or is it? Yeah. Do you want to come up and talk? Um, they, they're a local de developer, but you can come up. Good afternoon. My name is Mike Churchfield. I'm with AMH and I uh, love your murals, by the way. Oh, thank it's, you. It, it's very, it's awesome to see around town. So thank Appreciate you. It. This project is intended to be a for rent community. And just to touch on it, we maintain backyards, front yards. We want to be an amenity for the neighborhood. We don't want to have people that are not taking care of these. This is going to be a high rent project with rents proposed at delivery at 2,975. 3,075 and 3,295. We see values of these homes on a comp basis at 571,000 to 631,000. Um, the other development you were referencing is a 58 lot community. It's not 78. So again, that was a very tight development. It was a site that was almost deemed unbuildable. Well, I but, know their driveways were like five feet. Yeah, theirs was very tight. And we want to make this one obviously more based on the constraints of the neighborhood. We totally understand that. Again, we're doing a three and a half time qualifier for the renters in here. I don't think that our intent is not for this to be a frat house neighborhood or anything of the nature. Obviously, we don't we want to be open for any renter. That's our goal. But again, we will we monitor that. We have uh, property management in Reno, so they monitor this stuff left and right. So if people are parking and getting obnoxious, again, that's something within their lease that we would take care of. So again, we want to be a good player. We want to be an amenity to the neighborhood. I, you know, as a six generation Reno guy, I am a proponent of infill growth. It has to be done right. And the reality is it's going to happen no matter what with the town growing at the rate it's growing and there's a housing shortage and we're trying to offset that. And the reality is if uh, right now, very few people have the liquidity to go out and purchase homes and we're trying to fill that void. Well, you know, I don't want to see kids growing up in apartments without a yard to plan. That's not the goal. We, you know, we want to create something nice. We have a presence here and we just want longevity. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, Abby, I believe Jeff Foster is a representative from Development Services. Correct. Hi, Jeff. Um, I, I, the applicants, I will get back to you in a minute. I just, uh, we're not like the planning commission in that we don't have a, a staff report. So I always have to check my understanding of the master plan and the administrative code and all the things that, I mean, you quote very ably and you go through each of the findings in your document. I just need, to, I just want to kick the tires on that and see I making sure I understand it right. So if you'd be patient, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, so, so Jeff, um, there was a statement made about density and in my mind, there's a lot of different things that we might look at in this application as to, just to, to see if it, it holds water. Um, the density one still um, concerns me. 
Um, I wanted to ask, first of all, when I look at the uh, Title 18, and it has a lot size for SF8 zoning district of, I think it's 6,000 for interior and 7,000 for corner. Um, going back to that, as just that as I to, uh, isolated, as what was the purpose of that standard? What is the purpose of that standard for single family home, eight acre properties? So Jeff Foster, associate planner for the record. So different, obviously different residential zones have different minimum lot sizes. Um, so the SF8 zone was intended to have a certain lot size, i.e. the 6,000 and 7,000 square feet, um, just as a, as a kind of a broad, you know, areas that would be zoned that that's kind of the lot sizes that the city wanted to see or traditionally has seen. Uh, but there are of course other zones that have other minimum lot sizes and, uh, you know, across the city, you want a, a, a spectrum of lot sizes, right. To have different size homes and different, you know, amenities and things like that. So, um, just, I, I it's a convoluted answer, I feel, but I just, I'm just not sure. Well, let, let me pose a few more detailed questions. Would it be true to say that that was created so there would be some consistency in the nature of the neighborhood, the way it looks, the height of the homes, the spacing between the homes? Yeah. The amount of something like that, yeah, the vegetation? Yeah, they, yes, yeah, that, yeah, exactly. That, that was one reason. Uh, the development to, pattern, a consistent development pattern, correct. Right. And would not that lot size, the six or 7,000 square feet, also denote a, um, a degree of concentration of, of density that the city was looking to be consistent for, for that particular zone? Yes, yeah, re yes, recognizing that the cluster provision does exist as a flexibility mechanism to, that would allow that, those minimum lot sizes to be reduced. Exactly. So, Without that, it wouldn't it wouldn't be possible. It would be turned down as a project. Right. Okay. Right. So the real key here is to focus in on the adequacy of the cluster provisions uh, to ameliorate things like noise, light, all of the other things that are are in the findings required for both the tentative map and for the the major site plan review. Would that be true? Yes. Are yeah. We, okay. Yeah. Um, so in terms of that, if I understand correctly, I, I know you're, what's the minimum lot, the 3,000 square feet? Is that the lot size, the average, or the one that you're wanting approval for? So the majority of the of the lots, um, the widths are the same on, on all these lots, majority of them of 35. So it, it wouldn't go under the 35 foot width. I mean, the, the, the size square footage, of the lots. Though. Square footage. So most of them are over 3,000, all, all of them are over 3,000 square feet. Okay, like 3,200 is about the largest. Correct, yeah, I can, I can get you the exact no, I number. Just wanted to I didn't want to say an amount like 3,000 would be inaccurate, but 3,200 would be. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that's, so going back to Jeff, so I just wanted to clarify that. So the applicant is requesting, it's not 50% smaller footprint, but it's still a good number of percentage. Um, is that something you've seen quite uh, often in infill within single family residents and applications before that it will go to, I mean, I, I, I'm sorry, when I look at the, just look at that map, it looks denser to me. It just looks denser. So is that, is that, is it being asked, is it excessive? Is it normal? Is it half of the course? Can you give me from your experience any idea of where this pitches in the general range of things that have been approved or or turned down before? So it, it's not uncommon. I would say that it's not uncommon. Um, and what, what, what you often end up finding is these remnant parcels that are available for infill are less than ideal in terms of shape. Uh, you know, you don't have the traditional shape that would allow standard lots and streets and everything else. So the, these parcels that are available left in the city to develop, a lot of them are challenging and uh, and and uh, they're less than ideal in terms of a standard development pattern, right? So um, all that is to say that what you are often seeing on current development applications are these kinds of 
non-traditional lots or non-traditional uh, proposed developments, uh, because that's kind of what is conducive given the shape of the lots and, and obviously also given the um, economics of, of development now to, you know, requiring uh, more units to be able to, to make things pencil. Okay. From your background, would you agree that, would you agree with the applicant that this is not denser than less, it's, it's not, it is not as dense as, or it's not denser than the existing homes there? Well, I, so the, the the density that that it, that is allowed by the cluster provision is simply a mathematical uh, uh, calculation, right? If you're allowed a certain number of units in a based on a parcel size in the zone, right? Mm -hmm. And I think Eric, you indicated that there were 29 units that were allowed uh, for this parcel. The the density provision allows a, a, a multiple of that, the the 15 percent increase, right? So. So that's what, in theory, would be allowed under the clustering provision. Okay, so fifteen percent more than twenty nine. So it's a you're using density as a technical term, but in terms of looking at this map, I see what you're saying. Okay, so it, yeah, it's, it's dense. Two different, yeah, yeah. You only have to look and count the number of the new ones on the west boundary with the existing family homes, and it's den much denser than. Well, I wouldn't shouldn't say much because quantitative is important. But it just looks denser. Yes, clearly. Okay. Yep. Um, regarding tentative MAC findings, and um, I find some of these to be so general, but I just want to clarify my understanding because it may turn into a question. Um, to quote, the characteristics of the project as proposed and as may be conditioned are reasonably compatible with the types of development permitted in the surrounding area. Can you give me any examples of what it would mean to be in this like case like this? reasonably compatible that's so general it is um yes it is so sometimes things are made to be general so that there's there's more flexibility right but the reasonably compatible they're single family detached homes just like the 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 adjacent uses um uh, being single family detached um maybe reasonably uh maybe incompatible or potentially incompatible would be something like a a high density multifamily you know high rise project something like that right so yeah but if it, if it is general and it's meant to be then one of the public commenters said this doesn't fit with our area it's too it's, it's going to look so new it's so different it looks nothing like the homes that are there so could i think a case could maybe be made to say that depending upon your definition of reasonably compatible that it isn't compatible or it might be compatible I'm just devil's advocate just wanted yeah. to clarify that yep and subjective it it's is subjective, yes. Um, but it that said, it's still part of the findings, which need to be made in order to approve the project. Uh, the final one is um, turning to clustering as a term. How does how do you and uh, development services evaluate whether quote the clustering proposal compared with a more traditional site development plan better attains the policies and objectives of this article? What does that mean? It, 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 I, I don't understand. Again, that's too general for me to look at, although it's part of the, cl the cluster, and that's a very critical element of this proposal. So uh, I have, I, I'm not familiar with that particular provision or uh, statement that you just read uh, verbatim. So I can give you the, the reference to the code. Yeah, if you, you would. Yeah, 18.08.603, and then in parentheses E, parentheses 3. Okay. So um, the, the, the clustering, let me see if I can answer it this way. Uh, the, the clustering provisioning code is meant to, in general, take a, a, a space that has certain resources, uh, rock outcroppings, you know, water bodies, things like that, recognizing that those areas you want to generally protect. And therefore, um, you, you set those areas aside the remaining developable area uh, may not be conducive to achieving the density that is desired. And therefore you allow the units or the lots to be made smaller, recognizing so that you you get the density, but then you're, you're, you're setting aside a lot of those other areas to be protected. That's the traditional use of clustering. Um, so that may or may not be the case here. Okay. But 
Um, so maybe, uh, I think that's my final question, but maybe you could just take a look at that and say, when it says better attains the policies and objectives of this article, I, I could you just eventually just expand on that a little bit more for me? Because I think it's, again, critical to uh, looking at this project. And it, not right now, but just, just for now. Fair right. enough. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Jeff. I You're appreciate welcome. it. I don't mean to spring these things on you, but again, we don't get the benefit of a staff report at the NAB, so right. I'm forced to ask them here. Right. Okay. I'm sorry. Thanks for your patience. Could could you come up again and just have a few more, have some questions based upon some of that and some other things? Um, I think you answered a lot of my questions about grading. I was concerned about that. You know, I would want to see the, the two-story homes kind of go above, so that that is good. Um, so that that deals with just uh, looking into people's backyards or things like that. You're going to be like, yeah, so that's good. Um, are these the plots on the west going to be fenced, walled? What would be uh, the barrier there, physical barrier? Yeah. So, <clears throat> from my understanding, is there's there there is that grade separation. Um, so there's going to be a combination of a, of a wall and then a two to one slope on the property itself. Uh, on on the proposed properties along here, um, and then they they will be fenced as, as far as the backyards. It's just just like a traditional um, single family detached home. So where the lines are on 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 here, this is these are these black lines pretty much represent where the fence lines would be. Okay, so a fence. You said a wall. Where would the wall be? So. So in here, this this is the representation of the of the of, of the grade change here. So there's a two to one slope proposed here. When you get farther down along these these lots right here, there will be anywhere between uh, a two to four foot wall, and then that slope as well. And then so on the top of that wall, most likely you're going to have a a fence. So this the the wall will be down below here, and then you'll have uh, a slope transitioning into the lot. Okay. So that's not it's 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 mainly going to be seen by the new residents. It, it will be protected from the fence, and you're not going to see that on on the on the other side. Um. So you're also going to be lower than the properties on the west side. Um, how many street lights are there? You are you planning for that? Do you know yet? Um, that's that's going to be based based on whatever code is, and I I don't know what the off the top of my head what that would be. Okay, I just wondered if those lights would be high enough. Three, I think. I guess to, I guess it would to be about three. with the the lots that the people live in as well. Like illumination is one of the conditions I think in the general part of the uh, the findings. So yeah, I just wondered about that. Um. Let's see. In terms of the landscaping, again, the buffer is critical here, right? The buffer is what allows you even to come before the planning commission, because otherwise we're asking for 3,200 square feet. It just wouldn't pass muster without that. So I want to dive into that a bit more. Um, how high is the landscaping going to be? How high? high? Um, is this as far as like trees or, or what? Yeah, if you if you're using landscaping as a a reason for saying that this will mitigate things like noise or other things impacting residents who've been there for a long, long time and, and others. Um, I'm wondering if you're looking at the landscaping as a method by which to mitigate sound or something. So therefore the height, how density, yeah. um, all that kind of thing would be important. Yeah. And, and so that's, that's part of the thing, the issues that we would like to address at the, at the neighborhood meeting that we're going to have, because, we we are required by the city of Reno to do street trees along Seventh Street as well as the the proposed street, right? But the landscaping within the the common area is kind of up to um, what. Obviously, there's going to be trees that are going to be be planted, but where those are placed, you know, some people may want to see their views trying to be protected and not have a big tree in their way, or others might want to not yeah, see anything like that. So I think that's something that we can uh, negotiate. Um, later on in the process. Okay, so right now you haven't, it's not within the application. It was a great one, by the way. You get a lot of detail. I, I couldn't get through all of it, so that's why I may have missed it, but there's nothing there about we could, specifics yeah, we're just, to the landscape. Exactly. Just, you're right just now. guaranteeing at this point that it will be landscaped. What specifically that's going to look like is is, is going to come down at later. Okay. Later 
Um, in terms of the tentative map findings, um, you, you you mentioned the schools around there. Had these schools, do you know whether they've ever been filled to capacity? I'm not sure. We just are, we just take what, but the proposed, however many lots are proposed, we take that calculation and, and add, this is approximately how many uh, students we are we are proposing to. So it's, it's a add. mathematical calculation. Yeah. But, but you don't know, you haven't done research or to find out whether those schools hit capacity ever? I believe the school is the school district will be reviewing these applications and um, during this process and um, okay. can comment so on that. So still, still an open question yeah. then. Um, in terms of compat compatibility with the surrounding development, um, of the ones, could you go back to the other one, the plan view? That's a very helpful one. So the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, There's nine two, eight, on Everett that I can see there. How many are two story and how many are single? Um, from from memory, I believe the more of the two stories are farther down around here. Um, and I think the two story might be um, almost like a daylight basement type of a thing, but I, I honestly don't. I couldn't tell you right now which ones are. Um, but they are story. they are mixed high anyway, yeah. basically. We know. Could, could I just? Uh, they do know. We have a lot more latitude in NAP than yeah, planning yeah. commissions. So. Uh, the very first two stories. I okay. The third house down there. So. Okay. So, so after that, there's two stories four that and five. Yeah. So the nature of the neighborhood is there's a mix of two story and single story. Oh, yeah. Yes. And if I'm correct, looking at your, um, it wasn't renderings, but these are actual pictures of models that have been built, right? That you were showing us. Oh yeah, those, those all, are. In order for you to get overall a cubic kind of footage, you go, they all go up to a second story. As yeah, all, all the ones proposed are going to be two story okay. on this. Oh, right. So, Jeff, would would that be one of those things that we were talking about that is a gray area in terms of fitting in with the the neighborhood that this is all two story and the other is mixed? I'm just wondering. Anyway, just I'll just put that out there. Um, Mr. Chair, uh, Gary, sorry to cut you off. In the sake of time, because we do have public comment, I think uh, Mr. Chair also has a comments to give or questions, okay, and the I, public also has questions I'm as well. I'm sorry. Can so, I come back? I'll come back to mine. You're right. I'm you. going too long for too long. Sorry about that. Let's move on to, to public comment. Uh, would. Thank yes. you. Okay. First, we have Mr. TJ. Can you leave that slide? Yes, of course. Okay, so first of all, um, I would... TJ Harvey, for the record, I would ask everybody involved to read the cluster development, because when you do read the cluster development, there's a lot of codes that are not being met here or being manipulated. So first of all, um, <clears throat> seems like the only reason to call this a cluster development all is to get around the minimum lot size as required by SF8. So if you want to get around that, then call it a cluster development. That is what it is. Even with that said, um, you have some things that we're talking about right now, like the buffering. You have to have 30 feet. It's literally illustrated in the code between the property line and the other property line. So as you see the Western boundary, that's one property line. The other one is 17 feet to that nearest property line of the end. They're counting the yard size, which is 20 feet. You can't do that. That should be obvious if you look at the pictures. You need at least 30 feet, so that's a problem. Also, if you look at yard matching, it's RMC uh, 7.D3 yard matching states, rear yard widths of the proposed development shall match the rear yard widths of the existing development. All those homes need to match the existing development. So that's a problem as well. So either you have to delete code, go against the code or follow single family eight zoning requirements. Um, they talk about the open spaces. Like I mentioned, in other renditions, you see the, uh, I think this is, if you're looking at to the right, there's a open space right there. That is a retention pond. Kids can't play in a retention pond. The farthest right next to the cemetery also designated as a retention pond. Kids can't play there. I don't know if you want kids playing in the 30 feet between houses unsupervised. That doesn't seem like a very good uh option for open space either. So all the open space that's touted seems to be non-existent to me. It's just a dense cluster that is over um, overpopulated. Um, 
they also talk about uh, the not triggering a traffic um, impact analysis. That may be correct because it's under the required amount. However, there's other things that can trigger traffic impact analysis, um, such as projects seem to have impacts related to intersection capacity, safety, neighbor, neighborhoods, or other concerns. So uh, in years past, there was a school that was proposed that was denied because they didn't believe they could get emergency vehicles into there. So here's my question. If there's a fire that breaks out in this densely, um, this neighborhood, how does the how do the the residents escape and how do the fire trucks get in without creating a bottleneck? Seems like a safety issue. Uh, there's plenty of other concerns. Like I said, I would just really recommend reading through what the codes are on a cluster development because we're not matching them. Personally, I don't think this at all matches the definition when you read cluster development. Again, like I read earlier, this is just doesn't fall under the right criteria. Thank you. Right. Up next, we have Barbara Perosa. Thank you. Again, my name is Barbara Carosa. I am here today to address the agenda item of the development of the 2400 West 7th Street. Something I'd like to point out before we lose this map, the very bottom home, and if you look to the property line to the west, that is totally erroneous to follow anything that needs to be developed for that particular lot size. That lot almost needs to go away. But I wanna go back to my points. I would like to advise I'm a resident of Reno for over 44 years. My previous residence I lived in for 38 years. I could go into more detail of my prior residence, which was county at one point, its zoning and how the city zoned it and its uniqueness as it contained acreage you can contact me personally if you want that information. I have been aware that the property in question has been for sale when the sign was placed on the property and of its current zoning. I have hoped another church would purchase the property. An interesting private school was in negotiations as well, but were unable to come to an agreement. I would strongly support this type of use for this property. This area was developed in the 1970s. I have come to know many of the original property owners who still live in their homes today and are aging in place, which is a significant fact to the area they want to live in. That fact strongly speaks to the neighborhood. There is also a transition scene of new younger families purchasing in the area and making these homes their desired area to live. I understand the city, while working within current zoning, tries to best fit the appropriate classification of an unusual size property within the parameters of current zoning available for every parcel in Reno. When an unusual size of a parcel exists, size of the parcel determines actual zoning designation. I know of parcels that have existed when acreage is involved and zoning, I personally believe just doesn't fit. But whenever the practice is used by the city, it continues. In the example of the proposed plans, the designation of 28 units is trying to work within these parameters. The developer is citing a cluster development, but by municipal code exceeds these standards by 42%. This fact alone negates the development proposal. When the planning commission reviews the proposal, it needs to be pointed out that this glaring inaccuracy. And I'm going to have to make this real quick now. Back in 1995, Montessori School wanted to build on this property. And it, it was determined that it was unsafe based on 7th Street traffic. And we need to be cognizant of the fact that we can't do anything to infrastructure. And 7th Street is even more impacted by traffic than ever before. Thank you. Up next, we have Mac Rossi. For the record, Mac Rossi, uh, I just came onto this project here in the tonight, and there's a couple of things I'd like to uh, at least address. One is that uh, I live on a street that isn't as wide as your standard street, and concerned with parking, when two cars are parked parallel to each other, any traffic where there's going to be a change of 
two directions of the cars are very difficult to pass. And I think that's something you ought to consider. If this project should go through, through the Planning Commission, there's three items I'd like to suggest that are, should be on the HOA. One is that there be something roughly like 20% only for rental. If there's an opportunity that this, this item should go through, that they supply through their HOA, their own snow removal, so they don't have the city coming down their street requiring to do that. And the two streets that are off the main drag should be maintained the same as the city streets are, not to be ignored in any way. Thank you. All right, if you would like to give public comment on this item, I know we still have um, people in the public, now would be the time. And then if you would like to give public comment on Zoom, I would ask that you raise your hand using the raise hand feature at the bottom, and I'll give you a second to do so. Um, and then I would like to pass it over to Jeff Foster um, to kind of, oh, yes, go ahead. Sorry, I didn't see your hand. <laughs> I actually just wanted to speak to the school question of if 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 there was overcrowding. My daughter currently attends McQueen I'm High School. Sorry, can you I'm say so your sorry. name for the record? I'm sorry. sorry. My name is Ashley Harvey. Um, my daughter currently attends McQueen High School. Its capacity is 1,200 students. There's currently 1,700. There is one classroom that is standing only. Not only just McQueen, I, I'm not gonna be able to quote the statistics on the elementary and the middle, but I have had kids at both Grace Warner, which is the school right down Everett, Clayton, as well as the private school, King's Academy, all are overcrowded, all are over capacity. Um, and I did have one quick question. The reference photo, I believe it was 2501 Everett for uh, looking out over, that is before Everett starts to slope down. So if you're gonna use that as a reference photo, I think it would be I think I would like to see some other photos to see the account in the change of the slope of Everett. Thank you. And then Jeff, can you kind of speak to, for the members of the public, next steps after the NAB and where some of these questions such as the fire access, uh, school capacity is gonna be discussed or will be discussed? Sure, thank you, Abby. Jeff Foster, Associate Planner for the record. So the NAB meeting tonight is an advisory uh, meeting, uh, an advisory board that the, uh, the comments that you're providing um, will be forwarded to the case planner who is reviewing this application, Leah Picotti. Um, any any uh, comments that come from the NAB members will also be forwarded to Leah. Um, and so she will uh, take all of that into account. The process is going to the uh, item, as uh, was mentioned earlier, is intended to go to the Planning Commission on September 18th. Um, in between then and now, uh, departments like or, or uh, agencies like the Washoe County School District will be reviewing the application and providing direct feedback. Um, uh, in fact, since the, the school issue has come up multiple times tonight, I can say for sure that uh, they will be providing uh, comments on not only the capacity of the schools at this site would be zoned for, but they'll also be addressing things like school bus stops and, and things like that. So the school district is very proactive in uh, reviewing these pro uh, reviewing projects and providing their input. Um, so Abby, did that address? So yeah, the various agencies will be providing feedback and that will all be forwarded to the case planner, to the engineer, et cetera. Um, and will be wrapped into the analysis and the staff report that is ultimately generated and uh, is sent to the Planning Commission for the hearing on the 18th. That hearing will be here at City Hall and it begins at six and there is a Zoom option as well. Typically those agendas will be po posted no later than three business days. Um, so that I would recommend keep an eye out for that. Um, and comments that you would like to continue, if you have more comments later on or more questions, um, we can get you the point of contact to forward those um, over so we can capture those as well. Um, and if uh, you have questions, uh, go ahead. Abby, the, the staff report will be or, uh, also posted uh, with that agenda. Uh, prior to the hearing, and it's approximately a week in advance? Yes. Yeah. So you can download the staff report 
um, and see all of the comments and agency uh, feedback uh, about a week before the hearing. Awesome. And if you guys have any other questions, I can help you after. Go ahead, sir. Just a quick question, maybe you can answer. What, since this is being zoned for a, I mean, it, since it's being planned for a rental community, I'd like, I think everybody would like to know how much the rents could range from because what you have to remember and you know what's going to happen if people are renting these places and they're three to five bedrooms and they're renting for 25, 3,000 bucks, they're going to have three to five people in these places, even though they may not want to do that, it's going to happen and you're going to have three to car, five cars for every property. So it's not so. I just like to know. I think everybody would like to know what the rents are going to be for this. He did mention the rents, rents and budget. I think he sir. did mention the rent range. Did you not, sir? I, I did. Yeah. My hearing's not really like sure. twenty five hundred to thirty five hundred. Okay. No, it's. I, I can address that. It's twenty nine seventy five, three thousand seventy five, and thirty two ninety five. And really, we're not. We do not rent by room. We only do um, a, a singular lease. So. We try and avoid situations like that at all costs because, again, right. the yeah. traffic yeah. impact totally. The reality, just the right. reality of the economics of today is that someone that rents from you for thirty two hundred is going to sublet, and they're going to not. They're going to go around you, and they're just going to have people living in that house that you won't know of. And all of a sudden, it'll be three to five cars in that property. Oh, I understand your concern. Absolutely. And it's very well founded. And what we do, like I said, we have local property management. We enforce this stuff okay, so you will. immensely. We have a local office and we want to make the neighborhood nice. We don't want parking wars. That's the last thing we want. So again, when we do a master lease, if we start seeing multiple residents moving in, that's a lease violation. So again, we want to make this good and, and we'll have an additional right. meeting to address all of this. How close are these houses going to be built to each other? Uh, it's whatever the regulations are with the city. They have setbacks and we're by No, no, I mean your house. It's not from me to you. The two, you're trying to put two to three on, on one lot. It's like, it's how close feet. are they going to be Ten together? Feet. Five foot, seven. Five yeah, foot. Yeah. That's the same. Yeah, I'm about, what about 25 foot between houses now? So. Oh, I, I, and, I, and, and, and again. One, one more question. Why can't you take and just build singles? Okay. Home, I mean, single story, and use one whole lot that fits my lot. If I could interrupt, these these conversations would be better served at the neighborhood meeting that it sounds like they're proposing for you. And I would encourage all of you that do have issues and concerns to go ahead and and uh, go to those meetings because actually, I applaud the developer for doing that to. To, to reach out to the neighborhood and maybe a lot of your questions can be answered there. So thank, thank you all. And the developer, how does that information get back to you? Because that's gotta be important and critical because we can't say it now. <laughs> I don't know. Go that... ahead, Jeff. Thank you. Yeah. So again, the, the feedback from tonight, I will be providing uh, to Leah in general. Uh, however, and she can watch the, this is being recorded and she can watch and listen to it all as well. Right. But, um, and, and the members of the NAB, um, have the option of providing written feedback to the case planner, Leah Picotti. Um, this won't, I mean, it, it, it won't be coming back to the NAB again. So the, the, the planning commission is scheduled for the 18th. This is the NAB's one bite at the apple to provide feedback. Um, however, you are all encouraged to submit your comments directly to the case planner via email, uh, preferably. Um, and, and that way, and every one of those comments will be uh, appended to the staff report um, and will be looked at in terms of, you know, kind of the common issues that are being brought up. Um, and Leah will be evaluating those and dealing with, uh, you know, the applicant, dealing with the, um, you know, other departments that might help to be able to address those issues, i.e. engineering and public works for the traffic issues. Uh, so it, it would be best, it would be in your best interest to submit those comments in, in written form via email to the case planner. Question was, at the developer meeting, 
how does that information get back to it? And, and yeah, and it won't. Again, this is the NAB's one bite at the apple for the NAB to provide their feedback. But but also uh, also recognize again that the NAB is an advisory. Uh, the NAB is an advisory board, um, uh, and uh, not to discount the role, but they're they they don't they're not a, it's not a voting uh, thing. Um, and, and so their, but their feedback, I can tell all three of these gentlemen are probably going to provide feedback, uh, to the case planner and that will be, uh, fa factored in. All right. Uh, we have one final public comment for this item, Tim Harvey. Oh no. Okay. Perfect. Thank you so much. And there, all right. That concludes public comment for this item. All right. Go ahead, Tim. Tim Smith, for the record. Oh, sorry about the late comment. Just one thing that wasn't brought up uh, that I do want to identify for you guys. There currently is a bus stop basically right at the exit of where the new road is proposed. Um, and just consideration for that of, I don't know, maybe you guys have considered that where it could move, uh, where the maybe the city's already given you some input. Uh, just wanted to bring that to attention as well. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Because that was right at the entrance of the church, right? That's where the, yeah. Oh, thanks. Go ahead, TJ. <laughs> Sorry, for the record, TJ Harvey, there was supposed to be one more public comment at the end. So I just want to summarize by telling a story of about seven months ago, right near the uh, number one house is where the GLCC signage sits. About seven months ago, a drunk driver went up through that sign. If that drunk driver went into the area right now, they'd be in someone's living room. Like we mentioned, this is a dangerous street. We lived on this house and saw multiple accidents. There was an RTC bus through the fence not too long ago as well. These accidents occur up and down 7th Street. So those homes that close to that street is a, a very dangerous situation. And thank you, Nab, for your time. And thank you, Jeff, for being here. Thank you guys for providing your input as well. I appreciate you. And that's in my comment. Thanks. All right, moving on to item B. Board Commission Committee Member Reports and Announcements. I just, uh, as uh, Councilmember Taylor mentioned earlier, Carol Crane I resigned from the board. I just wanted to um, just express thanks to her for her service. She was always in attendance. She always gave great attention and cared about the residents. So uh, thank you, Carol. Well said. Bryce, do you have anything? All right. Abby? Nothing for me. Okay, move on to item E, future agenda items. Okay, and the final public comment. Go ahead, TJ. Oh, you're good? Okay, yes. great. <laughs> Perfect. Go ahead, Barbara. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. I wanted the opportunity to state this. Part of what I have looked into with living in this neighborhood, back in 1995, the Montessori school system asked the church, would they be conducive to putting a school at the rear of the property? Yes, that was a, a consideration, and they went through the approval and the permit process, whatever that was. It was determined through a traffic study that the 7th Street traffic was a significant risk to people going out of the area because if you, and it's the developer had a good example, 7th Street has an elevation increase that's pretty significant. And it's dangerous when the roads are icy, but every road's dangerous then. But it, it has an elevation, it curves, and then it comes back around. That was determined by the traffic study that it was too dangerous for the proposal to go through and that proposal was denied based on that traffic study. I personally believe there should be a traffic study done by an independent third party, not associated to the developer, that will either prove 
there is no risk to the development, but when you have that many homes and not when you had a school, but when you had that, when you have that many homes in that area and that many cars, there is definitely a traffic risk. Thank you. Mac, you also had closing public comment, Mac Rossi. Hi guys, just came from the tour of the new swimming pool on Moana. Uh, it'll open on regular scheduled day of October the 23rd, uh, whether you swim or not. Uh, we got $52 million tied up in it, pocket change for some of us, but I'll tell you right now, it's worth the tour. They're gonna have people there after it opens up to give you a tour of it, and it is tremendous, really. It's well worthwhile, thank you. And Bryce. that com concludes public comment, Mr. Chair. Uh, Bryce had a comment. Go ahead, Bryce. Yeah, Bryce Chisholm. I just wanna say that, yes, I've seen all the pictures of the Moana pool. It looks pretty great. And then I grew up on James Lane, which is a little bit closer up to the school, a little west up the street, up 7th. And I know that that road is curvy, that is icy. I think we're at like a point where it's a real balancing act where we want infill and we want development. The only way for these developers to make it happen is like bunch these houses in there super tight and nobody from the neighborhood likes it. You know, I mean, there's been several up at, I up by Rob Drive and May Ann, and they just did two developments up there that were very similar. And I wasn't happy about them when they happened as, as well. But that seems to be the way that things are going right now. And so finding the, that code, the cluster, seems to be like the key to me figuring out if that is actually they can do that or not. So I would say go to the next meeting and let your voices be known. So thank you. I would just add to that, the planning commission meetings would be well, beneficial to, the, to go to. And the city and, the, and the, the boards and the commissions, they do listen to your input. So don't, don't lose hope, I should say. Uh, keep up the fight. <laughs> okay. I think that ends our public comment. Am I correct, Debbie? Yes, Mr. Do Chair. Do I have a motion to adjourn? I so move. I'll second. And I, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Long meeting. Thank you all. Thank you. All right. Good night. DJ, um, one second. Sorry. Let me.